السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله والحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد فالحمد لله ثم الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to all of the respected listeners out there all of the respected ulama mashayikh community members mothers fathers saimin wa saimat those fasting in this blessed month of ramadan i pray that you are in a state of strong faith in a state of good health and in a state of happiness and smiles and i pray that allah ta'ala keeps all of you and all of us like that together for the entirety of our life mm-hmm. and into our graves and into the hereafter until we reach paradise safe and sound in the company of our beloved Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the eternal bliss that Allah has made for the believers. It's a very humbling experience to be here on this occasion to speak about some of the giants in our tradition and some of the goals to follow in their footsteps. We know that Dar al-Qasim is an institute which strive to disseminate religious knowledge, to be inheritors of the prophets, and to be a source of distributing that knowledge. That's the very meaning of our institute um, and the very meaning of the name that our institute is named after, Dar al-Qasim. As the Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith, إِنَّمَا أَنَا قَاسِمٌ وَاللَّهُ يُعْتِي So while the divine knowledge comes from Allah himself, Allah, Allah's sunnah and system is that he sent people to distribute that knowledge. And the prophets were at the forefront of this endeavor and at the forefront of this task. And then the scholars after them became their inheritors of this great work as the ulama warasatul anbiya. So it's humbling to be in this position with Sheikh Maulana Bilal and our dear brother Adnan and to bring and shed light on the goals of this project Um, we have an expansion of the Institute of Dar al-Qasim taking place and we have this library, library project taking place and if anyone has been able to visit the main campus you will see some of the more recent renovations and one of the things that you will find in common is that each of the different rooms and studies have been named after various ulama and this is done under the understanding and with the understanding that we are nothing without those who came before us. Our very survival as Muslims relies on a very, on on an interconnectedness to those who preceded us, without which we would not have the legacy that we have today. We are like leaves on a tree, no matter how small we are, as long as we stay connected, we'll remain green and fresh. But the moment we separate from that tree, we wither and dry and we will not survive on our own. So we have to recognize the very nature of this connectedness and those who link us to those branches and those who link us to that trunk, those who link us to the roots, which are showered by the heavens from the divine knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his revelation. And it's through recognizing them that we show gratitude for what we have. So again, if you are If you've had the the pleasure and the honor of visiting the main campus, you'll find that these different rooms have been named after different ulama and different scholars of of our tradition. And this library project very intentionally has been named after one of the great savants of our time and one of the um, our um, spiritual and knowledgeable forefathers, Maulana Anwar Shah Kashmiri, Rahimahullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And we have our dear Maulana Bilal to shed some light on who this individual was and who this great giant was so that we can appreciate every time we go into that library or every time we take any benefit from any of the scholars and teachers who are connected with Dar al-Qasim, you should know that some of what we have gained was a product of Maulana Anwar Shah. Rahimahullah. So without further ado, Sheikh Maulana Bilal, if you would kindly shed some light on this pious predecessor of ours. Jazakumullah khairan. 
Bismillah. Bismillah. I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, really, this is a, a joyous occasion and also a very blessed time to be speaking about this project in the last 10 days of uh, the month of Ramadan. You know, I think before I, I get an opportunity to talk a little about, um, or I take the opportunity to talk about Anwar Shah Kashmiri, rahmatullahi um, I just want to mention uh, briefly that I did get a chance today, just briefly, uh, shortly before um, I, I uh, came on, um, I came from the building and I saw the new uh, library facility and uh, Alhamdulillah now looks complete and ready to accept books. Um, it's just a wonderful feeling to come into a space that is um, allotted for the purpose of, st of the study of the sacred sciences, uh, for the purpose of you know, uh, developing creative minds and providing resources to those people who are thirsty for knowledge. It's really just a wonderful, you know, a uh, feeling uh, to see the growth of a community to a point where we're talking about the establishment of libraries that are uh, essentially devoted to the sacred sciences. Um, so uh, again, before I talk a little about Anwar uh, Shakashmiri Rahmatullahi, and there's really a lot to talk about in his biography, uh, as an individual and as uh, a person, um, you know, his biographical information is quite extensive. Uh, but a little just about the importance of the library itself. You know, my, my teacher, um, Dr. Abdul Halim Nomani, or Mona Abdul Halim Chishti Saab, as he's known in Urdu, um, he, he actually happens to be, um, uh, have a doctorate in the library and information sciences field. And he's devoted a good amount of his life to um, surveying and, and documenting the history of libraries in the Islamic uh, period or in the Abbasid period in particular. And one of the things that he mentions in his thesis is, um, you know, a general civilizational type of uh, comment on libraries. And he says that essentially you have two categories of libraries. Um, Actually, even before that, perhaps I could start with saying that, you know, he, when he talks about civilizational power and, and how civilizations, de uh, civilizations develop, he identifies, of course, you know, the three main uh, elements of uh, the strength of a civilization as being, you know, military power and, and military might on one hand, and then you have economic might, and then you have intellectual power. And the intellectual strength of, an, of a civilization, he says, he identifies as essentially the foundational one more important than even economic and military strength is a community or a civilization's intellectual strength and its intellectual foundations. And then he further then uh, proposes that in terms of the intellectual resources that a civilization possesses, you have uh, essentially two categories of institutions. You have uh, educational institutions and you have libraries. And then further, he uh, classifies libraries into two categories. And this is, I think, critical because when we think about libraries, more or less, you know, we, we restrict ourselves to this conceptualization of libraries as um, buildings and rooms that are full of books, right? Shelves that are full of books or maybe, maybe computers and write, written materials. But at Dal Qasim, we very much stress the oral tradition. And um, our teacher, uh, Dr. Nomani Abdul Halim Nomani Saab, Habidahullah, um, he says that, you know, actually the first category of libraries in uh, human history and in Islamic, in the Islamic uh, civilization in particular was the living library, right? Al-Maktab uh, al-Hayya, the living library. Uh, and, and that was the, you know, the, the nature of knowledge and preservation of knowledge in the first three generations. And then you have, of course, libraries of, the, you know, sort of the conventional library that we have today that are buildings and establishments that have large uh, collections of books. And he actually has a very fascinating study of libraries in the, in the history, not only of uh, Muslim Islamic civilization, of this ummah, but also of previous civilizations. And I, I invite everyone um, who has the ability to read the book, to read his book on the uh, Islamic uh, libraries of the Abbasid period. But in any case, um, when he talked about living libraries, I found that is very interesting, right? So I'm segueing into now the biography of Monan Anwar Shah Kashmiri, Rahmatullahi, because Anwar Shah Kashmiri, Right, um, and he was known by many titles. Um, one of those titles was um, Imam al Asr, the Imam of the time of the era, uh, because he was, in the true sense of the word, a polymath. Right, he possessed mastery and proficiency in a wide variety of sciences, and he wrote in a wide variety of sciences. 
even though he was not a prolific writer in the sense of, you know, um, many, many Muslim uh, intellectual figures like Suyuti and even contemporaries of Alama Kashmini like Maulana Ashraf Ali Tanvi were known to be profuse writers. Uh, and Alama Anwashah Kashmini did not write much, but what, what he has written is indicative of his expansive sort of vision. Um, so he's written in, in the fields of Islamic theology, right? He wrote in philosophy and he wrote on, you know, the topics of the hudud of the alam, of the, you know, the uh, origination of the universe. Um, and it was such a phenomenal work or a set of works that he wrote on that topic that uh, the great Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire, Mustafa Sabri, is reported to have said that when he read this book, then he realized that there are still philosophers in our time. Otherwise, he had thought that our era was void of uh, experts in the, in the field of philosophy. Um, so he wrote on that topic and, you know, and he wrote in uh, the field of hadith and in the field of fiqh. Um, and in, in, in each of the sciences in which he wrote or he spoke, he demonstrated not just an ability to transmit what was already representative of the Islamic tradition, but he was also contributing as a creative thinker, as a mujtahid. And so he's widely recognized as an individual who whose opinions are considered um, independent. He was like a mujtahid in so many fields. And so uh, a great amount of attention even today is given to his works um, and his opinions, not just as a sort of a naqil, you know, someone who was more or less uh, copy and pasting what was already present in the Islamic tradition, which is obviously also a very important element of Islamic studies. So one of his uh, contemporaries and seniors, uh, Maulana Ashraf Ali Tanwi, right, uh, known as Hakim al-Ummah, he used to refer to uh, Al-Alama and Washa al-Kashmiri as, as uh, a living library, a zinda uh, maktaba, right? He, as, a, as a living uh, represent, uh, like a library because of how expansive his knowledge was and because of how much he read um, and I thought that was very interesting because um, uh, Alama Kashmiri was known for his obsession with books and his, his, uh, his attachment to the library. He was always in the library. And in fact, as a students of knowledge, we were, uh, we were made aware of one of the anecdotes from his life was that when in, in the library of the Dal Ulum in Dioban, uh, which was actually a very kind of closed and cramped library. It had two floors with a gallery uh, but and it was filled with books, um, and it still is, I think, in the same condition as it was somewhat uh, at that time. But it was it was um, you know quite a cramped uh, space, given the number of books that they had, and he would constantly be there. And uh, sometimes he would essentially just tell the um, the librarian to leave him inside the library, and he would spend the night in the library. Um, and so his, one of his students, uh, Mufti Muhammad Shafi'i Uthmani, the father of Mufti Taqi Uthmani and my teacher, he, he would say that sort of uh, in, in a desire to uh, follow his lead, he would do the same thing and he would make the request from the library and that, you know, during the afternoon hours when they would close the library and the students would, and the teachers would be asked to leave, um, he would make a special request. Mufti Shafi would make a special request from the librarian, just kind of let him stay inside and have his like, you know, during nap time, just kind of be there. Um, and, and we had heard about this. And so when I was in my specialization hadith program, we tried the same thing at least one night, you know, to, to revive that sunnah of uh, being locked in the library at nighttime and then just coming out for Fajr. Um, and I believe we did this at least just once or maybe, maybe twice. Um, and it's such an incredible feeling, right? The idea that uh, you're 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 just surrounded by books, and there's just so much barakah and sukun and tranquility in that space. So Alam Anu Shakashmidi was, you know, he had this attachment to the you know, conventional idea of a library, but he was a librarian himself. He internalized so much of of learning, um, and this was in a time, uh, you know, Subhanallah. If just to give a little biographical information, I think that's uh, somewhat relevant. Um, you know, he was he was born in the late 18 or the the, the last quarter of the 1800s. Right, the late 19th century, I think 1875, he was born in 1292 uh, Hijri. And Alama Kashmiri, rahmatullahi, you know, um, he didn't live a very long life, but from a very young age, he had uh, such an attachment to knowledge. I think it was the age of 13 when he formally began to study um, what now we study, you know, begin studying at the age of 18 or above. Um, 
he had such an attachment to to books and the books of those times were most mostly handwritten right some of those handwritten copies that you see are not as easily readable and legible compared to some of the computer printed and modern prints in terms of the paragraphing and the typesetting it's very easy to read a good amount when uh, Anama Kashmini would read, um, he would, he, a, a, according to some uh, documents and some biographies, he would read uh, around 200 pages on average a day. And many of the books that he would be reading would be, if not most of them were all written in this very small, cramped, like type of almost cryptic word, uh, uh, script um, that was very difficult to read. Sometimes it was diagonal, if you know some of those prints, uh, the, the famous Indian prints that you know, the, 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 the marginalia or the, the comments, the commentary is, is like written in diagonals. And sometimes it's, it's, it's in between interlinear. It's in between the, in, in between the, the, the lines. Um, and, and his average reading speed was about 200 pages. Um, and before it said that he studied Sahih Bukhari, uh, he attempted to uh, read two major commentaries. Um, the Umdatul Qari of uh, Badruddin Aini, which is a massive collection, so I think almost in 24 plus volumes, and the Fathul Bari of Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani. And when he was reading that, he finished the reading of these two works in the month of Ramadan in preparation for the study of the Hadith. And I think an average was two, between two to 300 pages that we would reading uh, uh, every day. Um, and he had such a phenomenal memory that um, not only was he able to read these uh, pages and these these very difficult uh, um, handwritten books, but he was able to retain it in memory as well. Um, it said that once um, Mufti Muhammad Taqi Rathmani, my teacher, mentioned this in one of his books, that Alama Kashmiri was um, in class and he was reciting uh, wor a word for word, right, because of his uh, the strength of his memory, he was able to quote word for word. He was quoting an entire passage from Ibn Humam's Fathul Qadir, right, which is a, a commentary on the uh, this uh, fiqh manual of the Hanafi Madhab Al Hidayah. And Al Fathul Qadir is not like a book that you typically memorize, right? Um, but one day he was in class and he was just, you know, from memory he was quoting the passage verbatim. And you, he could tell from the students' expressions that they were astonished that he was quoting it from memory. And in, you know, in Bukhari class, for those who are interested, he used to actually keep the commentaries in front of him, right? And he used to actually quote from them. And he, it's very interesting, students would notice that he would, he was so familiar with the books that he would just grab a book, right? He'd grab the book, it would be closed. He didn't have a marker on it. And he would just open to it. And very often he'd open to the exact page that he wanted to quote from. It was very interesting. It means that he was like always ready and he knew where in the book and oftentimes he would open to the exact page that he needed to find the quote. But this time he was quoting from memory and the students were astonished. And then, you know, Adama Kashmiri said that, he said, Jahileen, he says, oh, you ignoramuses, right? You think that I memorized this before coming to class? He says, I remember many years ago when I was in the city of Tonk, this is a city um, that I had, I had come across the Fatul Qadir and I read it there and it's in my memory from, from then. I mean, he had a really phenomenal memory. He, actually, he reminds me of um, uh, Sheikh Amin's teacher and our teacher, uh, Allama Khalid Mahmoud, Rahmatullah, who just passed away about two days ago. Um, he, when he came to Chicago the last time that he came to Chicago and we were fortunate enough to take classes with him, um, he was also going from masjid to masjid and he was... Um, delivering lectures and I was astonished that he was above the age of 90 already I, I think he passed away in the age of 97 so he must have been in his mid-90s already and uh, Alama Saab was quoting entire sections of books of Usul Fiqh and other works theolo theological works from memory and I was just thinking subhanallah you know like there's a certain amount of commitment to learning that it allows a person to be able to memorize and to retain that information so um, in any case, Alama Anushak Anushak Kashmiri, there's a lot of information I can give about, you know, his his memory and his uh, uh, his biography and where he studied and whose students are and whose teachers are. I'd love to be able to share that. But it suffice it to say that, you know, he was a library in, 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 in the sense that he had retained so much knowledge. There are very few books that he wrote himself, but the books that are compilations of his lectures, and I've, I've seen this because I've taught, 
um, the, the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi, and I've used his notes at the, that, that are found at the bottom that were collected by his students, um, a called Arf al You could take one line of his notes and write a, a, a thesis on it. I mean, it's just phenomenal the amount of information um, that can be found compressed within his very comprehensive uh, um, statements uh, that were collected by his students. And, and these are not like writings, uh, his, in, his in independent writings. In fact, many of his books that were compilations of lectures um, do contain mistakes because as my teacher, uh, Dr. Abdul Halim Saab used to say that because he used to spend all day in the library and he was reading from all these books, right? And the students didn't have time to use the library like he did. Most of what he said was passing over their heads, right? And that's why he says you find mistakes in the lecture notes because the students had no idea where he what he was talking about in a lot of things. They didn't understand what he was talking about because he was at a different level and the students were at this level. And it's very hard when you're an intellectual, right? It's very hard to kind of under sympathize or empathize with those who don't have the same degree of reading. If you read the, the works of Alama Muhammad Zahid al-Kawthari or Alama Anwish al-Kashmiri, you'll see this, that oftentimes you'll understand what they meant many, many years in the future when you've read some of the books that they've read and you're like, oh, okay, now I understand what they were talking about. So maybe just to introduce Alama Kashmiri, I think I suffice with this much to say that, you know, he was really a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, personality, but more importantly, he was, an, he was a lover of libraries. He was a lover of books. And because he was such a lover of books, he had such a passion for reading. Um, it, it's, I think it's truly appropriate for Dar al-Qasim to give this title of, you know, un the Unwarsha al-Kashmiri library to the library because it represents a combination of both the oral and written tradition. He was both a living library who had a very strong attachment to the, uh, the space, you know, that library space. And that's what we kind of want from, you know, from all the students and the teachers and those who come to, uh, uh, you know, benefit from that space that they also develop that attachment and benefit as Allah Manu Shai Kashmiri did. We often see that, subhanAllah, when a building is constructed, it's named after perhaps a person who was the donor, right? Yeah. A person who donates to that building um, generously, perhaps will have that whole segment or that whole um, uh, chapter named after them. Um, with this library, it's being named after the ulama who had the greatest contribution towards providing what we have today the type of things that we need and the resources that we need to not just survive in this world, but to survive in the hereafter and to be people of the hereafter as well. So Mawlana Anwar Shah Rahimullah uh, most certainly fits that bill and is worthy of that uh, title in that library. And it's only fitting as people who are trying to follow this path that we acknowledge these people, as I mentioned earlier, who paved the way for us, uh, showing the adab and showing the honor and the etiquette towards the, 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 the tools of learning and the mediums of learning is something which is embedded in our tradition. Even showing adab towards the pens that we use, right? Allah Ta'ala named the whole surah after the pen, Surah Al-Qalam, um, to show the honor of ilm. Allah Subh'ana Ta'ala, right, has, um, we, we know that we should show honor to even the books that we use. You mentioned Maulana Anwar Shah, Rahimullah, and the marginalia at the sizes of the books, they're written in a way that they had to fit onto the page, right? And diagonally, upside down, he had so much respect and reverence to the books that he would not turn the book. He himself would stand up and move around to read those places, right? He wouldn't read um, uh, and, 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 and turn the book out of respect to the book. He himself would get up and make himself move as it wasn't fitting in his eyes that I should make the book move for me as we have to move for the knowledge, right? So we show this um, and, and then the greatest source and the greatest medium of knowledge are the Ahlul, the people of knowledge themselves. Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu wa ulul ilmi qa'imam bilqist. Allah Ta'ala honors the people of knowledge by mentioning them in a verse with him and the angels. And Allah Ta'ala bears witness that he is one and his angels bear witness and the people of knowledge who establish justice, right? The, who establish justice in the land. And that justice is established through knowing your Lord first and foremost. Otherwise to reject your Lord 
is zulum. It's a form of oppression and it's a form of injustice. So honoring the people of knowledge is something that we also um, uh, must do. We, uh, we honor every, every mode of knowledge. We even honor the letters, right? Mm -hmm. Even the letters of a book. In the Quran, uh, the letters represent the, the highest form of ilm, the, the highest form of knowledge of the divine, the huruful muqatta'at, right? So before you can even learn a word, you have to first acknowledge that you don't even know the meaning of a letter. We don't even know, forget anything else, forget any of the other texts and all of the other great books that are, mashallah, in the shelves behind you or that have been compiled by our great scholars. Before you can access that knowledge, you have to first acknowledge your own ignorance and show humility before Allah by saying, I don't even know the meaning of alif. Mm -hmm. right? And this is what we try to do in Dar al Qasim and again, why we have taken the very active approach, Sheikh Amin, Allah bless him, has taken a very active approach with everyone involved to make sure these ulama are acknowledged and that they are recognized um, because we wouldn't have anything that we have without them. And that's our tradition, showing respect to the ulama and the people who carry it. Um, so we also have with us, mashallah, um, uh, a very, very special guest as well, um, uh, Brother Adnan Malik. And he has been actively involved in the library project as just a little bit about his background. He actually had uh, acquired his bachelor's of sociology from Ohio Wesleyan University. And then he went on to get a master's of sociology from the University of Chicago. And it was there that he started working in the library on the South Asia microfilm project. And he finally decided to become a full-time librarian and became the South Asia curator at Cornell University in 2003. And two years later, in 2005, he joined UC Berkeley as South Asia curator and cataloger of the South Asian collections at the South and Southeast Asian Library. So he has a lot of experience in the field of libraries and he has been actively, again, as I mentioned, participating as a consultant in the planning of this library as it's very pivotal and is very central to a, an academic in institution, which is what we're trying to establish through Dar al-Qasim in the United States, right? In order to have that relevance that we hope to have as Muslims, we have to have these academic institutions. And if you want an academic institution, you must have a library. This is something which comes part and parcel. So we have, again, um, our brother um, Adnan, if um, you wouldn't mind, um, perhaps if there's some words you would like to share um, and, and comment on this library project, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you, Molana, and my salams to everybody who's listening and viewing. Um, uh, like Molana Musa said, that I'm a consultant. Uh, the librarian at the official librarian at uh, Darul Qasim is, of course, Molana Kamaluddin, who had to, who was originally going to be here to represent the library, but unfortunately, because of some family issues, he wasn't able to um, make it. And uh, we pray and hope that uh, the family issues resolved. Uh, I personally find it an honor and a, a very refreshing challenge um, to uh, be part of this uh, Darul Qasim library project uh, because uh, uh, it is very heartening to find uh, ulama in this day and age who, um, in, in the United States, who appreciate knowledge and appreciate the role of libraries in uh, preserving and spreading knowledge. So it's, uh, it's a very great uh, honor and it's also very satisfying at many levels that uh, I'm involved with this project uh, at Darul Qasim. So what type of patrons will the library in Darul Qasim serve? Will it be restricted to the students there or um, what type of patrons are we hoping to serve um, at Darul Qasim? Uh, we are, of course, uh, given that this is an, uh, a library for an academic institution, so the primary uh, people that the library will serve are, of course, the scholars and students who are related to that institution. Uh, but given the nature of scholarship and the sort of institution that Daru Qasim is aiming to become, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a source for scholars, generally speaking, who are interested in Islamic knowledge and things Islamic. So, of course, primarily Darul Qasim scholars and students, but then it's going to be a resource that will probably be available for all serious scholars of Islam and things Islamic, uh, hopefully in the United States and beyond. And then as our resources grow and, you know, 
we are able to provide services. Uh, I'm confident that we will also become a resource for the community, at least those community members who are serious about Islam and Islamic scholarship and to learn things and who have an appreciation of our tradition. This is going to be a great resource for them as well. Inshallah. So then how will Dar al Qasim's library continue to organize um, the knowledge and information that they are gathering and collecting, right? Um, uh, meaning, how does the library contribute towards Dar al Qasim's organization of knowledge and information? Well, uh, uh, like I said, that uh, library is there to serve scholars and scholarship. So, um, Libraries grow around a scholarly institution based on its own activities and interests. Uh, it's there to facilitate them. It's there to anticipate their needs and meet them. And it's also there to uh, maybe foretell the future needs and sort of uh, try and plan for those. So the prime mover in any institution is the sort of scholarship that's carried out. And mashallah, Darul Qasim is a institution of traditional Islamic scholarship. So that is going to be the guiding principle of the library collection as well, of course, because uh, librarians are there to meet the needs of the scholars and the students. But then Daru Qasim also has a more expansive vision where it's traditional Islamic scholarship that is uh, geared towards the needs of the contemporary community here in the United States and also the rest of the world, Muslim community, and to anticipate what's coming in the future. So naturally the library is going to try and match those ideals and it's going to try and uh, build a collection that of course needs, uh, needs the immediate needs of scholars right now who are engaged in scholarship and then also keep an eye on what, what that entails in the future. So if there are particular sorts of uh, scholarship specializations that scholars at Daru Qasim uh, specialize in, then of course that will be reflected in the library collection. So for example, if uh, Hadith scholarship is emphasized, then of course that it behooves the library to have a wonderful collection of Hadith scholarship. And given that Darul Qasim is uh, of course firmly committed for, to, uh, uh, to preserve and present and to uh, disseminate traditional knowledge, uh, uh, traditional knowledge, and scholarship, but also to address the contemporary issues and contemporary issues of academic and scholarly and philosophical interest, then it's also important to provide for those needs. So then the collection has to reflect what is, uh, what sort of uh, uh, scholarship is being carried out in other uh, academic institutions, for example, secular institutions or the needs of the community and what the community of uh, contemporary Muslims in the US and elsewhere are what, what they are discussing because all that impacts scholarship and the ulama of course have the mashallah the tools for and the resources to engage in this discourse but then this discourse goes beyond the community of the ulama it encompasses the, the entire Muslim community it can encompasses those people who are engaged in any sort of scholarship about Islam and the ulama have to respond to it. So the guiding principle has to be the activities of the scholars and their students, graduate students especially. And then based on them, it's the duty of a librarian to sort of anticipate what the needs are and try and provide for those needs. And in that process, a collection sort of develops over time. And with such a broad vision then of the library, um, what kind of books will the library have? Obviously we know it's a Muslim Islamic, it's a Muslim institution, Will there be other type of books in other types of languages? And what other kind of resources will the library have? And do libraries typically have besides books? Well, um, like, like, you know, uh, uh, has it's been said before by Mulana Bilal and yourself that, you know, there's a traditional Islamic scholarship is a discourse. It's a multi-generational discourse. And it starts beyond before books. So it, it was an oral discourse, an oral tradition that then took on the form of books and continues. And now it's increasingly becoming digital because that's where scholarship is uh, heading. <clears throat> so I don't think the Islamic tradition is going to be different uh, in that regard. And along with our books and our oral, oral tradition, uh, our print tradition, we'll also start and have all actually already started developing the digital tradition. So any library that's serious about scholarship in any field right now is facing this challenge of 
balancing print versus digital. And Darul Qasim is not going to be an exception to that. In fact, we anticipate that and you know, welcome that challenge. Um, and so uh, within books, again, it's a question of, um, uh, of course, ideally, it, you, would, you would want to get everything. Actually, even ideally, if you were to able to get everything that's published, either digitally or print, a lot of it is not worth it. So that's another major function of, a, of an academic library is to separate the grain from the chaff. Uh, you know, if, the reason universities um, uh, uh, spend so much, uh, so many resources in libraries is to provide quality information. So it's a guarantee of quality. It's not just quantity, but it's also quality. And in an institution like Darul Qasim, which has a vision, it's even more important uh, where um, Darul Qasim library will provide resources that have quantity, but more importantly, quality. Quality that is judged by the traditional Islamic scholarship and also by modern critical standards of scholarship, right? So you mentioned uh, uh, Mulana Anusha Kashmiri. I mean, he wasn't just uh, an expert in fiqh or hadith, or, but he was also an expert in philosophy. So philosophy is, uh, or for example, questions of history. I mean, our tradition has a very strong historical dimension. So questions of history, questions of philosophy, questions of social, contemporary social relevance, that sort of then requires that we pay attention to these fields as well. But no library or no collection can collect everything. There's always a focus. And the focus here is traditional Islamic scholarship and it's how it's consumed, how it's produced in contemporary society. With a vision, with an eye towards the future, so we will uh, we will try and provide every sort of publication that is relevant in different fields to this central project. Right. That means that we just don't collect book, books or, or publications on fiqh and hadith and you know the, the basic core things that everybody knows a, 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 a institution of Islamic learning will have. But we also also have to pay attention to history, to philosophy, to social sciences, literary analysis because all that is in the background as auxiliary uh, resources for the central uh, interests of the scholars. And that's where the challenge is to provide primary resources, but also keep an eye on secondary resources, to keep an eye. And here the scholars, of course, guide us with their activities and their requests and you know, their anticipation, uh, what we should be getting. But in order to be a good comprehensive library in, for an academic setting in contemporary world, it has to be comprehensive in this, in this sense where you are um, including uh, a lot of things, not just the basic central uh, uh, areas of concentration. I appreciate that insight, especially you have nearly 20 years in the field um, working as a librarian and we hope and pray Allah Ta'ala uses you as a source, as a valuable source of bringing some of that expertise in those academic libraries so that we can also implement those principles in our institution, inshallah. I mean, um, and, and Maulana Bilal, I wanted to ask you um, a question also about Maulana Anwar Shah, rahimahullah. We've been able to directly benefit from some of his, of his students, mashallah. I remember one of the um, uh, a colloquial, uh, colloquium we've, we held on Islamic finance and Sheikh Yusuf De Lorenzo, who is one of the leaders in that field uh, was we, was able to conduct that um, discussion, and he he mentions about when his his journey of studying, and how he ended up with Maulana Yusuf bin Nuri rahimahullah, and he actually was uh, kind of delayed on his ship on, on a boat ride from Egypt towards India. He was on his way to Dilbant, and when he was uh, sidetracked because of some issues on their ship they had to stop in Pakistan. And he said, I'm just gonna get off here. He started walking and he told the ca uh, cab driver, take me, I wanna go to Dioban. <laughs> right. So this cab driver takes him to the Madrasa of Mala Yusuf bin Nuri, Rahimullah. And you have this, you know, Sheikh Yusuf Del Lorenzo is a white convert. So you have this white guy walking around in Pakistan and he shows up at the gates of, um, of bin Nuri town. And he sees actually, at that time he didn't know it was Mala Yusuf bin Nuri, Rahimullah. And he asked him, or he asked uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Yusuf, what is it that you need? And he said, I want to find Deoband. Malan Yusuf bin Nuri responded by saying, Ana Deoband, I am Deoband. And he ended up staying there and, and, and for the next 
X amount of years becoming a scholar, mashallah. So Mala Bila, I wanted to ask you about, and, and Mala Yusuf bin Nuri was a student of one of the most formal students of Maulana Anwar Shah Kashmiri, Rahimullah. So right. I wanted to ask you, um, perhaps if you could shed some light on some of the students that we've been able to benefit from and that we know about of Maulana Anwar Shah. I know the father of your teacher, Mufti Taqi, um, Damad Barakatu, was also one of his most primary students. Yeah. Um, perhaps you can uh, share, uh, shed some light on the legacy that he, he, he has uh, left through his students. Right, alhamdulillah. You know, this, uh, mashallah, as, as we know. Actually, is one interesting point, was, as you were mentioning or asking the question that was coming to mind, was that, uh, you know, I think many individuals may not um, recognize the name of uh, Anwar Shah al-Kashmiri, um, uh, in, in, in terms of, like, um, his contributions. A lot of his contributions are academic. Uh, but he was actually a very um, uh, spiritual personality as well, and he was very involved in movements that were... Um, uh, not purely academic in nature, right? I mean, his, in other words, his influence was not confined to the classroom. Now, I'm not aware of any of his uh, students who are alive. In, in fact, I, I believe that for some time, um, it's been the case that there's no living student of Ardaman Wishak Kashmiri who's been alive. We still have students of um, his replacement in the uh, in the position of the uh, the primary teacher of Hadith at the Darul Ulum, Mawlana um, Hussein Ahmad Madani, called Sheikh Al Islam Hussein Ahmad Madani. Some of his students are still alive, including my teacher, or some of my teachers, many of my teachers were students. Um, and, but one of them in particular, Dr. Abdul Halim Nomani, who I've been mentioning, was a direct student of Alam Anwar Shah Kashmiri. But because Anwar Shah Kashmiri Rahmatullah's teaching in uh, Deoband was in the early 1900s, and then in Dabil after that, in Gujarat, where he uh, ended up later on in life. Um, so he was still teaching in the early 1900s. So we don't really have any of his direct students, but from his... Um, uh, students, students, students. Uh, one of those personalities is uh, Alama, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Talal de Lorenzo, who studied under Alama Yusuf bin Ori, uh, But one of his other um, uh, students, who uh, in many ways did uh, sort of absorb a lot of his thought, was Qari Muhammad Tayyib Qasimi, uh, who was a teacher of Sheikh Amin. Um, and Qari Tayyib Qasimi was known also to be representative of a, a very interesting line or a strain of Diobandi intellectual contribution that I think is sometimes underappreciated, and that is the, the uh, uh, theological sort of thought and, and the, the, the focus on some of the, the rational sciences, right? Because Anwar Shah Kashmiri was one of the few scholars of his era and also every era, right? There are very few scholars who are able to combine the, what they call the ma'qul and the manqul, the rational and transmitted sciences together in the same personality. In fact, if you look at um, Islamic history, there are actually quite a few individuals. I mean, the list is long, but relative to the number of scholars in general who exist in every age, those who were able to effectively <clears throat> master both the rational sciences, philosophy and logic and dialectics, etc., but also the transmitted sciences like tafsir and hadith, commentary, and uh, et cetera, um, they're very few in number. And Alam Anwar Shah Kashmiri was one of those who really not only is on that list, but is quite high on that list. Um, because as I mentioned before, he was not simply a person who delved into those fields. Like we have personalities like, you know, Mullah Ali Al-Qari, who was a critical scholar and he had independent positions and opinions on, on issues but for the most part, um, you know, his contribution was of jama, was of collation and collection of information and, you know, bringing together a lot of the information that was found in these uh, works of the past thousand years that preceded him, um, or at least 800 or so years of uh, significant uh, written tradition that preceded him. Alam uh, Anushah you know, when he speaks on a particular topic, his opinion mattered and people paid attention to it and they knew that there was a lot behind it. Um, <clears throat> so that was a quite a phenomenal um, uh, contribution to the Islamic sciences. I, in fact, you know, one of the really interesting uh, contributions to uh, th thought in the field of usul al-fiqh and hadith and in tafsir as well, and one of the um, expressions of Alam Anwar Shah al-Kashmi that resolved, um, I think, doubts and confusions in the minds of not just the laymen, but, but, but uh, also uh, scholars and students of knowledge, was his categorization of uh, mutawatir, right? Some people might be familiar with, academics might be familiar with it. 
But there were a lot of questions in scholars' minds who even existed in his time. Um, and then also in the, in his, the, the minds of his students, uh, one of them being Alam al-Shabir Ahmad Uthmani. And Alam al-Shabir Ahmad Uthmani was also a phenomenal theologian, right? And a, and a master of the, of the rational sciences. He, he said that for a long time, he had a question in his mind as to how to understand like for the preservation of the Quran, right? Uh, because uh, it, when we think of this idea of uh, tawatur or this continuous and massive transmission that denies the possibility of a mistake or a lie that's absolutely certain in its um, epistemic, epistemic value. Uh, when we think of this idea of tawatur or a mutawatir thing, we oftentimes think about it as something that is established through a chain, right? It's something that has sanads. But Alama Kashmiri, he looked at the entire body of the Islamic tradition, and in particular, the two fields of usul, uh, theology, and also the field of usul fiqh. And he noticed that actually the scholars are talking about four different types of tawatur, right? And this is probably not the place to talk about them, but one of them is a tawatur of practice, that generation after generation has a sort of adopted and inherited a tradition that is so massively transmitted from generation to generation, so the multi-generationally, or inter generationally, but also within the same generation, that it does not require a sanat for it to be established as truth. So something like, you know, the way that people pray, you don't always ask for a sanat, right? Or the shahadatain that, you know, to become a Muslim, you, you testify that, you you know, in, in your, uh, your, your faith or testify um, using the shahadatain. You know, these are things that are known by tawatur, amali or tawatur, uh, at-tabaqa, and then there's also this concept, like, you know, in the Quran that I hadn't had this, you know, this confusion in my mind for many years that, and I asked experts in uh, qira'ah and in uh, Quran, Quranic experts about how do we say that the Quran is established to tawatur when we don't have a sanad for every qira'ah, like a particular sanad that tells us that this particular recitation can be found through this particular chain. And, you know, subhanAllah, I found a very satisfactory answer in the um, in this categorization of Tawatr into four types by Alama Kashmiri, which Alama Shabir Ahmad Uthmani, his student, said that he was he tried to find this categorization in, you know, in the Islamic tradition. He could not find it using this terminology or in this categorization in a satisfactory manner. And so he said that, um, you know, basically the Quran is established through what they call Tawatur Tabaqa, that a generation you know, establish this every version of the Quran, meaning every recitation of the Quran, with such a degree of abundance um, that essentially you become absolved of the need to provide a sanat, right? Like, for example, that, you know, the country of uh, Philippines exists, right? Like, that's some, that becomes something so uh, obvious and so certain in the minds of you know, the entirety of humanity almost, that you, you become absolved of the need to provide a very particular chain of proof for it. Um, so this was what one example of his intellectual contribution. And one of the figures, I think, so the, the list of his students, just to come back to your question, is very long. I think that if I was to give, you know, give a list, it would be too too long to, to list. But some of his famous students would be like Mufti Muhammad Shafi Uthmani, as you mentioned before, um, Maulana Shabir Ahmad Uthmani, um, Alama Idris Kandelwi, alayhi, who was also um, a great uh, polymath. Um, and then you have um, Mawlana Muhammad Yusuf Binori, um, who many people recognize through his institution, the Jamiat al Ulum al Islamiyya, or Binori Town. Um, and he is considered one of the best representatives of Alama Kashmiri's contributions in the field of hadith and fiqh. And then you have uh, Sayyid Ahmad Rida al Bijnori, who was also the son-in-law of uh, uh, Anwar Shah Kashmiri, rahmatullahi, and he records a lot of his uh, malfudat or his uh, um, significant uh, saying statements in a book. And he also has a commentary in Urdu uh, on the Sahih of Imam Bukhari called Anwar al-Bari, uh, which is a phenomenal work. It's incomplete because he wasn't able to finish it, but it's a, an Urdu uh, commentary. For those who aren't able to access the Arabic uh, amali or lecture notes, they can actually read this work. So Sayyid Ahmad Rida Bijnori Rahmatullahi was also a very significant figure for the groups of Adam and Shura Kashmiri. Um, and these were, these were his, uh, uh, some of his famous students. Um, some people uh, uh, mentioned, you know, his son's name, Anzal Shah Kashmiri Rahmatullahi, 
who also passed away some years ago, but I don't believe that he actually formally studied under him because he was very young when his uh, father passed away. In fact, this is one interesting thing about Alam Anwar Shaykh I can maybe finish with this, um, but he was so committed to learning that he actually married very late. Um, he was so he was so devoted to teaching that he actually taught for many years at the Dar al-Ulum Dioband under Sheikh al-Hind, Mahmoud, Mahmoud Hassan Diobandi, rahmatullahi, who's called affectionately Sheikh al-Hind. He studied, uh, he, he, he took over the post of Sheikh al-Hind actually as teaching Bukhari. And Sheikh al-Hind then said, you know, you're getting to a point where you need to accomplish and fulfill the sunnah of marriage, of nikah. So Alama Kashmiri agreed by the insistence of his teacher, Sheikh al-Hind, to marry at the age of 44. So he married at the age of 44. And, and uh, really that was because he was just so devoted and committed to, to, to learning that he had no time for anything else. In fact, it was, it was kind of well known that um, his students and the administrators and fellow faculty had to take care of his needs, like his, his worldly needs. He didn't really spend much time at home. One time a student came to him and said that, that Hazrat, you know, you, the roof of your, uh, your room, this is a little apartment probably he had, you know, on campus, the, the roof has collapsed. So he just like, said, okay, go tell uh, the, the muhtamim, go tell the, you know, the, um, the dean, Mawlana Habibur Rahman, who was the older brother of Mawlana Shabir Ahmad Osmani, and Mawlana Azizur Rahman Osmani, the head mufti of Dalum Diyuban. He said, go tell Hazrat Mawlana Habibur Rahman Sahib and him, you know, he'll take care of it. But he wasn't concerned. He had like, you know, he basically didn't pay attention to it. He was always up in the gallery of the, the, the library in Dioban. Mufti Shafi once when he was teaching a passage from a very difficult uh, text in Mantiq in logic called Mullah Hassan, he came in and he was looking for Adama Kashmini because he was teaching at that time and he needed help because he, he couldn't figure out a passage. And um, uh, Adama Kashmini was up in the gallery section. So he heard him walk in. He said, oh, what do you, what do you want? Mufti Shafi, what do you want? And he said, oh, you know, there's a passage of Mullah Hassan that I can't understand. So Subhanallah, from there he said, don't worry, don't come up. I, I, I know what, what passage you're talking about. He already knew. I mean, he had memorized, he had taught this long time ago. He had taught Mufti Shafi that book many years ago. He said, you're probably stuck on this passage. And what, uh, Mufti Shafi was astonished. He says, yeah, that is the passage. I mean, there are many passages in the book that he could have asked about. He says, you must be stuck on this passage. And then he explained it from up on the gallery. And then he said, okay, you can be on your way. And that's how, like, you know, Subhanallah, uh, one last, you know, Alama Shabir, you know, because you mentioned his students, Alama Shabir Ahmad Uthmani mentions once that their news began to spread that Alama Kashmiri had become very ill. And um, they thought that he was on his deathbed. So Alama Shabir, uh, uh, Shabir Ahmad Uthmani, uh, he then he rushed to the Uban and he rushed to, to his uh, place to visit him. And when he came to him uh, in his room um, and thinking that he's on his deathbed, he's about to pass away. He finds that he's, uh, you know, Alama Kashmiri has propped himself up with pillows and put a pillow in front of him and he's got a book in front of him. <laughs> and he's reading. So Alama Shabir Saab says that, uh, he said, Hazrat, look, what, first of all, he is object, uh, objecting to this, right? He said that, why are, you, why are you reading? In this condition, in this state of health, you're reading. He says, first of all, uh, is there anything that you haven't read up to this point? I mean, you've probably read everything. What is it that you probably needed to check at this point in this state of your health? And then he said, uh, secondly, even if there was something that you didn't know or haven't read already, what are we here for? Tell us, we'll go get the reference for you. We'll find that passage for you. So, you know, in, in summary, it's hard to translate this into English, but because he uses the word rogue, you know, like it's, it's like kind of an illness, but I think I, I'm going to translate it as an addiction. He says that, he says, but hey, you know, brother, what am I supposed to do? This is also an addiction. You know, this is kind of like an ailment. The books, yeah. you know, for me, he said like, this is kind of like, I can't help myself. You know, what am I going to do? I can't just sit in bed. So he propped himself up in that, you know, almost near death situation. He was reading books at that time. I, so I hope that spirit, you know, of like just passion for books. I used to, I, I learned this from my teacher in the oral tradition way from Dr. Abdul Hadim Saab. He would sit for four hours with a book. He wouldn't move for four hours. I would sit him, just, I would observe him just sitting there. And I saw that passion for learning and passion for books. Anwar Shah Kashmiri, Rahmatullahi, students have that. And if you saw that with Alama Yusuf Binori, Rahmatullahi, and others, their reading was so expansive. I mean, I think that they would make Adnan Bright very happy. Like if you're as a curator of a library and you see students with that passion and zeal for knowledge and losing books even, <laughs> or using books all the time, you get really happy. And I think the Al-Qasim will be very happy, inshallah, if people are able to kind of implement 
and 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 uh, and you know inculcate in themselves the spirit of Allama and Musha Kashmiri in this library to use it and to disseminate knowledge, inshallah ta'ala, like he did and his students did. Yeah, subhanAllah. Uh, oftentimes the students are reflections of their teachers, and perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves the knowledge of those teachers and continues to increase their rewards by taking work from their students. Right. You know, perhaps um, Allah knows best, maybe that's why. Allah allows me to do something even because of teachers who have been able to give me something from them. Allah wants to reward them, so he uses someone who's not so qualified like myself to be able to do that. But if a person stays long enough, then maybe they also become something because the nature of this knowledge is that whoever it reaches and whoever it touches, they are forced to become blessed and they are forced to become accepted by Allah because this knowledge is acceptance from Allah. So you see that through Maulana Anwar Shah rahimullah, and his students and you see it in Maulana Anwar Shah Rahimullah himself, as he was a student of Sheikh al-Hind, Maulana Mahmoud al-Hassan, um, the first graduate of Darul Ulum Dayuband, who was a student of the founders, Maulana Qasim Nanutwi Rahimullah and Mufti Rashid Ahmed Ibn Ghohi Rahimullah. So you see such a blessed chain of people and Allah Ta'ala continues that legacy so that they will always be rewarded. They will always be raised through the work of their students. And um, we pray that we can somehow be, uh, at the very least, an honorable mention on that link and be a source of maintaining that legacy through this library project. We, we, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates um, uh, the completion of this project. Um, everyone has a different role. So while yourself, Mawana Kamil, may Allah ta'ala give his family patience in this difficult time and give his, his father who passed away, rahimahullah, uh, the, the, the uh, spacious grave in, 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 you know, uh, of, of, of Jannah and give him maghfirah and rahma and etf mm -hmm. nar in this blessed month of Ramadan mm -hmm. and uh, Mawana Asifuddin as well, their brothers and their father, they lost their father either early this morning or late last night. And um, I pray Allah Ta'ala gives them ease at this time. So mm -hmm. he has a role as the librarian of Dar al-Qasim. You have a role as the liaison of Hadith. Sheikh Amin has his role. Everyone has their role. Um, Brother Adnan Malik, by he has his role. And everyone listening, you also have a role. We can participate to some degree. And don't belittle whatever role it is that you can play. But know that, you know, while it's nice to build, you know, to do uh, uh, social services, it's nice to, like, have food pantries and feed people, right, to feed people, the, the the nourishment which will carry them into the hereafter you can't compare that to a hamburgers you can't compare that to a sandwich you can't compare that to like you know milk so when you establish these type of institutions and these type of pillars within those institutions then understanding you are understand that you are establishing an establishment which will be a food bank for all of eternity that will help people make it to the paradise that will quench people's thirst on the day of judgment when they're thirsty which will satiate their hunger when they're hungry, which will bless them with shade and shelter on the day when there will be no shade except from the arsh of Allah. So those listening as well, you also have a role. Um, we are humbly requesting that you also do your part as much as possible to be a part of this. And Allah Ta'ala knows your generosity, especially in this month of Ramadan when everything can be multiplied with tonight as Maghrib approach, approaches being the 25th night of Ramadan, it could be Laylatul Qadr and it could be you know, that moment when Allah Ta'ala gives the rewards of Alfi Shahr and better, Khairu min Alfi Shahr, even better than that. So if you are listening to this, like, don't even hesitate to just make an impulse donation even. Sometimes we're out shopping, we have impulse buys and we get home, we're like, man, I shouldn't have done that. Like right now, just don't even have an impulse sadaqah. That's the type of impulsive acts that we should have, which is in good actions, in good deeds. So um, contribute to this. Right? There's nothing more valuable than establishing that ilm of deen. As heart-wrenching as it may be to see people without houses and to see people hungry and to see people without you know, um, uh, medicine, and we want to give to these places and we should, believe me, there's nothing more heart-wrenching than seeing a person without the knowledge of deen and not having proper institutions in our country where we live that can disseminate this deen and disseminate this knowledge. It's heart-wrenching to see um, our communities full-blown masjids not having an imam, someone who can properly guide them. And you have people who aren't qualified calling these shots and making these decisions. And then it's, it's heart-wrenching to see that. So we need to be able to have people um, and, and train people that were um, who are born and, and raised in these lands that 
know exactly how to relate to the people of these lands and train the next generation of ulama because we can't just simply ship them overseas anymore, right? So we have to have these institutions and this library is central to that. Um, we, we encourage everyone in to make sure that you give in these times and these blessed moment, moments of the month of Ramadan. May Allah Ta'ala accept, and, and I don't know if Sheikh Bilal, Mawad Bilal, if you want any last word, or um, um, a Brother Adnan Bai, if you want any last word, but um, I, I'm grateful to be, have been able to participate in this. I pray Allah accepts from every single one of us Ameen. in these blessed moments of Ramadan. Amin, amin. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallahu feekum, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, inshallah. Hopefully we'll be in touch in better circumstances, and as we meet here virtually, I hope that we can also meet really soon in reality, perhaps in the main campus of Dar al-Qasim to see the fruits of the labor of all the hard work and to benefit from the knowledge and the legacy of the Anbiya, the legacy of our beloved Prophet Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabi al-ummi wa baraka wa sallam bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Amin ya rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.